Hi there, Thack here. If you're watching this video, I'm highly suspicious you just watched the video of me making this, the visor for the Helmet of the Hound from Season 1 Game of Thrones, which is one of the cooler uh, pieces of armor in that series in my estimation. So, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this build and what's involved with it, the, the video that we did previously. We just wanted to have just the raw footage showing you what is happening. Um, and I think it kind of speaks for itself. But for those of you who are more technically oriented and curious to know more about the process, I just want to talk about that now. One thing I like about Game of Thrones is that a lot of their armor, although it's fantasy armor, has a pretty good level of plausibility to it. And I, uh, I appreciate that. When I do fantasy armor, I like it to have a plausibility, like a believability that it might actually be functional. I don't think like things to get too outlandish and outrageous, even if you um, do some pretty cool aesthetics with it. And I think it's important to keep it in the level of plausibility. So this helmet, I think, although a fantasy helmet, I think actually is pretty close to being uh, decently functionable. Um, functionable? I don't know if that's a word. Anyway, the, um, the structure of this with all its rigidity from the sculpting actually makes for a very hard and rigid uh, visor on there that's going to give a lot of protection against impact. So I like that aspect of it. The, the sculpting itself all turned out to be a little bit more work than I was expecting. I'm 30 years into this um, sort of thing and I'm still, every time I do this, I'm completely flabbergasted at the amount of time it actually takes to move metal and shape it into uh, the sculpture that you're trying to achieve. And I'm fairly happy with what I came up with here. I, Looking at it, I just see all the mistakes and all the inconsistencies that are not like my original, but the amount of time I put into it and I'm living in a real world where I'm running a business and I have uh, bills I need to pay and I've been neglecting uh, some of my uh, deadlines this week in order to get this done. So I need to get back to work. So I think what I've got is something that is reasonable to go to the next point. And in an upcoming video series, we're going to do the actual construction of the entire helmet and get this mounted onto an actual functioning helmet. So I just want to talk a little bit more about this type of armor. Fantasy armor has a historical counterpart um, in what's known as parade armor. During the 16th century, armor began to be used less on the battlefield and more for um, a showpiece and kind of a, just a kind of a, a showcase of the armorer's um, artistic abilities, um, something that the very rich uh, aristocrats could purchase and have something a very the ego pieces that they could uh, just show off to their friends. Uh, my favorite armor from that era would be Filippo Negroli, Filippo, and uh, Italian guy, and he did some really audacious designs, some really, um, and working with steel, not even iron, he was able to sculpt things into some pretty crazy shapes. So uh, he's been a real inspiration for me throughout the years as far as what possible, what is possible with this sort of thing, and it's something that I'm trying to uh, work towards. The process for doing this, um, is when I'm doing something like this, usually what I'll do is get some references off the internet, and I got a bunch of uh, pictures, Googled it, and a lot of pictures of the Hound Helmet, which was really quite helpful. So I'll try to get as many different angles as I can. After I've done that, what I do is I take clay and I do a quick mock-up. And by quick, I mean I spent probably an hour, maybe two hours, maybe a little bit more to, to rough this out in clay. I can work very quickly with clay and what it does is gives me a 3D topographical map, if you will, of what that shape is. And it's basically, it's a study for my brain to actually get that shape kind of ingrained, what I'm gonna be dealing with when I move to the steel, which is much harder to manipulate the shape. So if I can get my clay mock-up, that gives me um, a reference for me then to, to start working with the steel. Once I get the steel to a certain point, this becomes useless and then I usually just scrap it. Um, I, and I, with my clay models, I just do them to a fairly rough finish. I'm basically just trying to block out the topography of what 
uh, the highs and lows and, and some of the details just to, to kind of nail down the shape. Um, once I get to the steel, I, will, I get past that and then I start working into the finer detail on the steel. We begin on the steel with flat piece of sheet metal. This time I use 16 gauge, which is a little thicker than what I typically work. I usually work 18 gauge. And amazingly, the 16 gauge just being a couple thou thicker is still a lot harder to move. And I, I actually struggled with it. And to be perfectly honest, I broke through in a couple spots because I was kind of rushing it and uh, working with an unfamiliar material. And I had a couple of breakthroughs there breakthroughs that are not really a good thing in this particular case. But overall, I th I'm pretty happy with how the, um, the shape came out and everything. These, these little tears here, I can weld them up and that should be fine. I start with sheet metal, I make a bulge, and then working with dull stakes, I start forming the different landmarks and the highs and lows. And everything that I'm doing, I'm working um, in very blurred or rough feels. I'm trying to just get the various points nailed down, but I don't try to sharpen any detail. I try to keep it as blurry as possible, as long as possible, until I get everything established because things are going to move around. So then when, once I have that, then I start going in and ever tightening circles, uh, basically using sharper stakes, um, getting more and more detailed as I go along. But every time I work in a certain area, it distorts other areas. So it's, I find it a very draining sort of thing to do because you have to uh, be willing to make a, an area and then kind of destroy it as you have to distort it to get it to the next level. So it's undergoing this constant shifting and distortion. So you get something that's looking pretty good, but then to work on the other side, you're gonna have to sacrifice some of that. And it takes a very long time and a lot of patience to get it to the point where it's actually where everything is balanced um, to the point that you want. So we did this all out of one piece up until the ears there, and then they were made out of several pieces of sheet metal that were welded together. I just used the MIG welder to just kind of stitch them in there. My little MIG works pretty good for, for doing that, and um, I find it handy because you can hold it with one hand. Uh, TIG welder, you need two hands. You can do a cleaner weld, but it's actually quicker um, in a lot of cases to go in with the little MIG and just kind of stitch it together, and then a lot of grinding to make that work. Um, so there we have it. So I hope you are going to uh, come back and watch the rest of this helmet build. Um, if you've gotten this far in these videos without subscribing to my channel, I please, I'm asking you to please subscribe, give a thumbs up, uh, and comments. We really, uh, I kind of thrive on getting some feedback from you guys. Um, in some of my other videos, I'm getting a lot of good feedback, some really deep um, stuff, and I, and I appreciate that. So looking for some feedback and hope you enjoyed these videos and look forward to more in the future. I will see you back out.